Okay, this is chapter 25 of the book God Dictated to Me, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. Just as he dictated, commanded and directed, whatever you want to put there. It's not straight dictation, but it's likened to uh, the Torah to Moses and basically, frankly, the entire Bible is his through one man or, or another. He says it's best just to go with trying to get it back in focus. It seems that it works. Um, the main character of the chapter, like Isaiah wrote Isaiah. Um, you know, maybe it's a very long uh, book over 70 chapters. Uh, Book of Isaiah, 70 chapters. And he can get somebody else to do it. That's no problem for God. But, uh, yeah, the entire book. And do not take from or add to any of it. You know, it, it was kind of, that, that phrase was kind of limited to the Torah. But now that he's had me explain to you that all of it is his, don't mess with God's <laughs> book. Like the Christians messed with the Jewish book and attached it to their New Testament and said the Jewish people didn't know how to read it, that it was prophetic of Jesus Christ, which I have shown in these chapters, God shows, is totally ridiculous. He doesn't fit 11 or 53, which is what they hand, <clears throat> hang their hat on. And I've shown the prior chapters, that's just not possible. I mean, I've got a whole chapter that shows Jesus doesn't fit one verse of Isaiah 53, except one. The one that basically says the man's a sinner because he lies. I've got a top ten, including the greatest lie and deceit ever perpetuated from the lips of Jesus himself in the history of mankind. You can't top that. This is chapter 25. Again, I'm redoing the original 50 chapters that I did a long time ago, or started a long time ago, sometime during the COVID, when we found out about COVID. I sent out a check for economy stimulation. I used that check to get this camera. I know it's not the best camera on the market. <laughs> it blurs again. It's having trouble focusing. All the focus is just not working good. But that fixes it. I know I've gone 10, 15 minutes before to out of focus. So at least I can stop it now. It's called The Resurrection of the Dead. It's very short. The Rambam, Maimonides, compiled what he refers to as the Shlasha, Shlasha, Asar, Ikram, the, quote, 13 fundamental principles, close quote, of the Jewish faith as derived from the Torah. Maimonides refers to these 13 principles of faith as the, quote, the fundamental truths of our religion and its very foundations, close quote. Let me just let it go a little bit. Well, it could be. All right. Number 13 of the 13 fundamental principles is, quote, the belief in the resurrection of the dead, close quote. Ezekiel 1 and 10 are together a vision of the resurrection of the spirits of the dead to heaven. The creatures later identified as cherubs, a type of angel, with the spirit are going to and fro. Are going to and fro, east, west, north, and south. 
adding eyes to themselves and the wheel works and the wheels of the wheel works and taking them to the platform of heaven at the entrance of the eastern gate of the house of the Lord with the presence of the God of Israel above them. All of Israel's whose names <clears throat> all of Israel whose name will endure in the heaven God is creating that are righteous and in right standing with God are the eyes on the cherubs and in the wheels. The eyes represent the eyes of the spirits of the dead, a spiritual heaven. For behold, and this is God, of course, for behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. And, you know, there's a whole story behind that, and I think we have a chapter on it. Be glad, then, and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. That's Isaiah 65, 17, and 18. For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. The name Israel. Ezekiel 37 gives a vivid account of raising the dead to life into new bodies of flesh and bone. This was a common belief in the ancient age and middle ages. In this age of information and knowledge, science, medicine, and knowledge of the human body, few people believe that a human body can or will be resurrected anew by God. It is a primitive and medieval concept that was good for a time through the Middle Ages. That is why God provided visions of heaven conforming to the beliefs of the world of the Jewish people in the Middle Ages and before, and a spiritual heaven for a more enlightened time of reasoning and knowledge. The burden on Israel and the practicalities of such an event of millions of people, millions of Jewish people had died since the Exodus, suddenly appearing in the land from the time of Abraham to today is unimaginable. Six million from the Holocaust alone. Many would be illiterate and savage and few would be trained to work in this society. All would have to be housed and fed, educated. It would be a prophecy that destroys the government and the state of Israel. And yes, God knew when the Jewish people returned, they'd be a democratic country, state. It started as a state, they called the country the other day. The resurrection of the dead in the human body to a Heavenly earth, messianic here, or the world to come, which I think is after the messianic here. I'm not sure. It's too confusing. It's all made up by men. It's not in the Hebrew Bible. It's also said to be a sign that Moshiach has arrived or that it will happen in his lifetime. Well, I'm 66 now. God's been with me 16 years, and nobody has been resurrected. It's not going to happen. It's a bullet. Well, I'll carry on. This is a teaching from the ancient age and middle ages that continues today. Judaism's reliance on everything the sages say in an era gone by, by the oral tradition, is important for the laws of the Torah, which can be vague sometimes, like celebrate Shabbat. Well, how do we do that? Well, it becomes part of the oral tradition. It's just what people are doing. And 
then it gets to be almost a ritual. This is how we do it. But the Talmud's stories, opinions, and commentaries outside of that have to be viewed in light of this age of reasoning and knowledge, information, the internet. The day of the Lord and the arrival of God's servant David, according to the prophets, must be interpretation, interpreted with the evolution of humanity from the ancient age to the age of information. You must keep those in mind. The errors in between and the errors to come. Basically, it needs to be changed. That's right. Rambam's 13 fundamental principles need to be changed because Orthodox, for sure, I know. Praying every day, and they tell themselves they believe in the resurrection because they're supposed to. It needs to be changed. The belief in a spiritual heaven. And that's just a starter. But God wants the rabbis today, with all the knowledge we have, everybody was illiterate in the early Middle Ages and, of course, all of antiquity. And they had beliefs like that. They'd sit out by graves. God would tell them, stay out of the cemeteries. Because they didn't know what else to think. Their loved one had died. They just wanted them to come out of the ground and be alive. They really no concept of a spiritual heaven is revealed in the Hebrew Bible to speak of until God says I'm making a new heaven, a new host of angels. And those angels are the angels Israel, the Jews being picked up by the eyes that are eyes on the wheel works and uh, the creatures or cherubs. It's changed from 1 to 10 of Ezekiel. You know, make your own interpretations of what's being said for today. It doesn't, I just showed you a clear example. <clears throat> a clear example. Ezekiel 1 and 10, spiritual heaven. Ezekiel 37, resurrection of the dead. And it's everywhere. And it's fun looking for it. I, almost, well, I can't say exactly. I was about to say just about every chapter, but in every book you can find it in a few places. Well, this is written for them. That's an impossibility today. We know it is. Just like telling the rabbis, <clears throat> you're dismissed from tending the flock. Well, we know that's just not a possibility. How do you interpret it today? Well, God's dismissing you for false teachings and teaching man's word over his. So today, he knows you're going to get up and go to synagogue and teach your people, preach to them. But you're dismissed before him, rabbis. That doesn't mean the reckoning and dismissal goes away. I never hear you talk about it. And what's the Messianic era going to be like with no rabbis? Because if you've been dismissed and God's going to have to be responsible for that Messianic era, you're out. You better get to the school of remembrance in case you're right, but you're not. It's the first time I've heard you say that. <laughs> he's had living, he said. And, uh... No, there's lots of it. Within a chapter, you can find both of them for today and for yesterday. Antiquity in the early Middle Ages versus this day of information, knowledge, reasoning. You know, it all started after the period they called the Enlightenment, which basically ended the Middle Ages and uh, pretty much ends up with the um, creation of the computer. And then the internet and all the information you can get. But again, it would destroy Israel. And he knew Israel would be a democratic state. And I'm sure God doesn't want to destroy the government of the people who have returned. You come back, I come back. 
I'm going to place my temple among you. I'm going to make you a holy seed with sin forgiveness as I did with the 13 tribes, the exiles who returned from exile. And uh, they built the second temple. Well, as a holy seed, the Jewish people are going to build the third. Okay? This is the start of it. It's going to happen. And I think the whole book mainly has been they can't figure out how to get it up on the Temple Mount and that for some reason it has to be there. God never says that. Now, he does tell me it has to be on Mount Zion. Now, I don't know why that is. But he doesn't want anything to do with the Temple on Mount, which is uh, governed by Jordan, which is an embarrassment if you ask me. And he told me that and I said, what are they doing letting Jordan run the Temple Mount? He said they were always trying to appease people so they could have their state. And Palestinians, I don't know where we're going to go with it, but we do talk about it. The whole Middle East funnels them money. The Middle East pays them money for hurting Jews. Pays them money, criminals. And takes care of their families for them if they hurt Jews. That's, that's the enemy. They like having the enemy in your state. Refugees for 70 years now? And God says they're Jordanians. And he's pretty clear about it. He said, well, it was just Israelites there when they <laughs> when Rome pushed them out. So where'd they come from? He says they came from Jordan primarily. But Jordan won't recognize them as citizens of Jordan. So they remain refugees. Israel's certainly not going to recognize them. I think we should make Jordan recognize them. Well, they kicked, they kicked the Jewish people out of every country in the Middle East and kept their homes, their money, their things, their belongings, and they had to walk. From all the different countries in the Middle East, the Jews were thrown out, and they had to come to the Promised Land. You think I worry one bit about pushing the Palestinians out? I don't worry about it any more than God worries about it, and he doesn't worry about anything. I do what he tells me to do. I'm his righteous servant, Moshiach. Okay, that'll wrap it up. You're going to love the next one if you like that one at all. It's chapter 26, and it's called Reckoning and Dismissal. Remember, I bring the wrath, and I bring the reckoning. <laughs> I think that's better than being the prophet like Moses, Elijah, Moses. I bring wrath and reckoning. That's just fun.